if you go into anything, but I think especially podcasting and book writing, trying to be everything to all people, that's never going to be an effective way to create a like creative endeavor or succeed in a creative endeavor because you just can't. You can't be everything to all people. Hello and welcome to Woostream, bringing Will Amit to you. I'm Kendra Garakaki, the producer and editor for Woostream. Today's conversation will be hosted by Bay Area chapter volunteer leader and class of 09 College of Arts and Sciences graduate, Joe Gruber. Joe's been a host for us in the past, chatting with Professor Seth Kotler on the historical accuracy or inaccuracy of Hamilton, an American musical. Today's guest is Holly Adams Easley, also an 09 CAS graduate and author of an upcoming book, The History of Tarot Art, Demystifying the Art and Arcana, Deck by Deck, which set for release on November 30th, 2021. Joe and Holly met each other on their very first day at Willamette's campus and ended up living across from each other in Conaco Commons. It said that these two were frequently regarded as the friendliest individuals on campus, and perhaps the loudest, with both being awarded the Friend of Senior Class Award by the time they graduated. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to Joe and Holly. It, it has clearly been way too long. I'm glad that we get to do this. It sucks that we don't get to be in the same room for it, but seeing your face just makes everything better. It's hilarious to think about being called one of the friendliest people at Willamette when I just constantly felt like I was just trying my best to <laughs> get through it all. <laughs> Same, same, same. We did win that award, though, so there's something to be said for that. (laughs) I mean, maybe we weren't friendly. We were just very good at bullying people to vote for us. Yeah, that's probably... We're great campaigners more than anything else. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. For those of you watching, I I have a slight admission. Uh, I am not the most uh, knowledgeable on tarot, so if you have any questions that you think are a bit more... um, beyond the beginner level questions that I'm going to be asking Holly, I I implore that you put them in the chat box so we can uh, rise the level of sophistication of this discussion beyond uh, pictures on cards. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. I'm comfortable with talking about what it is, though, as a good starting point, though, because I do think that it's like pretty vastly misunderstood. I mean, I was a religious studies major at Willamette because I always was curious about how people made decisions and it felt like felt like a religion was a big part of that that the way I grew up I didn't totally understand and I feel like tarot is also something that people sort of search for when they're trying to figure out what they should be doing and they think you know maybe somebody else has the answers maybe I'm just not seeing them clearly so tarot is like a really good tool for that but I do feel like even amongst the most understanding groups there's still a tiny bit of an element of what is this superstitious baloney slash also is it evil there's always sort of like that two pro approach to skepticism about it. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, do you, do you mind if we start there? Well, I've already forced you to pre-order my book, which has a whole entire section about kind of the intro to what tarot actually means. It's one of those things where there was a huge amount of popularization in the late 19th century, most of which was completely made up just by people who okay. were sort of trying to seem cool and mysterious. During this sort of like growth of spiritualism that happened, you know, like in, in America, it was a lot of like seances and stuff. It was before that, but kind of okay. the same vein where similar to kind of in the last resurgence of the last six years where people started getting really into it again, people are just sort of looking for answers. Um, and so a really good way that people can try to convince others that they have the answers is by hearkening back to like ancient mysterious traditions. And so a lot of these writers from the uh, like late 18th and all of the 19th century basically just said, oh, Egyptians were using this. And they really pushed that super hard. And so it made it seem more like it made it seem like it had more gravitas and added a lot more mystery most of which is complete baloney but really in the early 20th century with the golden dawn and kind of like Aleister Crowley and sort of like the spookiness that was happening in that era tarot became something that more and more people had access to but it's kind of wild because it's something that is really ingrained in pop culture but it wasn't until basically kickstarter became a thing where there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of decks being put out every year by people who are not trying to get their scale to be like, oh, this is the tarot deck that everyone has. They're just doing it because they love it and they want 
to create art or whatever. So the book is a really cool way to sort of like address the more practical side of tarot. So we don't talk about the mysticism as much. We don't talk about like spirit guides or any sort any like of the woo woo stuff. This book is not really that. It's really about the art historical components of what made all these decks interesting and compelling for their time periods and how that sort of impacted both the art world and the tarot world now. So all the like scary stuff we try to dispel right at the front because it shouldn't be scary. But my podcast co-host and co-writer of the book comes from a really evangelical background and she's like left that background. I come Mm. from like a pure central coast of California, like occasionally going to Episcopal church sort of like you know, Willamette Methodist mm-hmm. level of <laughs> religiosity. So it's sort of interesting to have us both be coming at this at this topic from these really different backgrounds, but also like wanting to talk about sort of the practicality of what tarot art looks like. Is there baseline, like one tarot deck that's adapted with different levels of art? Or are there different tarot decks for different purposes? How does that work? It's a combination of both. I think that the deck that most people are familiar with is called the Rider Waite Smith deck. And it was published in 1909 in England. The creator is this man named Arthur Waite. The writer part is the name of the publishing company. And then in the last okay. like 15 years, Smith, who's the actual artist, has been tacked onto the end of the title. And she was mm-hmm. this really interesting artist and kind of like bon vivant of that era who was friends with all of these poets, all of these cool people. And she was just a really interesting lady. And for a, her entire life, she basically died like completely penning, penniless and without a lot of accolades, even though she created this deck that is sort of the go-to. It's often abbreviated as the RWS deck. And almost every single time you see a tarot deck in pop culture, it will be that deck, which is only going to get more intense because it just went into the public domain last year. So now it's going to be just like bananas reproduced in all sorts of different ways. But a lot of people will create decks that are Rider Waite Smith style. So they'll have a lot of the same uh, imagery and symbolism, even if they have slight variations to avoid copyright issues slash for the their own artists to express their creativity. Mm-hmm. But that's just one of many styles. So that's another cool thing that we explore throughout the book is that tarot was originally created just as a card game, basically in the late Middle Ages slash early Renaissance. It was sort of a game of risk where you bluff with each other and you try to one up each other with cards, probably similar ish to something like Go Fish and War combined, if you're familiar with those like child. <laughs> card games. And it was just something that that the aristocracy really liked. And so the oldest surviving deck is a deck that was created for this big wedding between two families in Italy during the Renaissance. And it was held onto for years because it was so filled with gold leafing and all of this really intense, like really ornate stuff. So they never used it for the card game because they were just holding onto it as like a collector's item, which then was sort of a boon to later researchers who were like, how do we know what it was like pre sort of becoming a method of divination? And the way that they could find out is that there these cards actually still existed. So that's its own sort of whole entire type of deck, the oldest one. It's called Tarot de Marseille. And it has a similar structure. All of the tarot decks basically have to have 78 cards, but it has a slightly different structure. The one that's the biggest competitor, I guess you would say, to Rider Waite Smith is called the Tarot de Marseille. And the Tarot de Marseille is really interesting because apparently, this is something that I never knew before getting into tarot, is that Marseille, France was like the peak printing city in all of Europe in for a really long time, like hundreds of years. So all playing cards were basically made there in the early 1700s. And they were developing it as a card game, obviously, and figuring out ways to do woodblock printing to make it faster and cheaper and easier, which really led to a lot of the proliferation of tarot, the card game, getting out into the world. And that led to the people who were trying to add mysticism to it to be able to have it be a really recognizable set of images because the cards were everywhere. So when they say, oh, these are the cards, and I learned from a mystical old lady who learned it from her grandmother, who learned it from her grandmother all the way back to Egypt, these images were things that people are in that region already would have been really familiar with because of how common the card game was. And so it was something that they could grab onto as sort of a way to go. So the two main ones that people will go back to are Rider Waite Smith and Terra de Marseille. Terra de Marseille is way more about numerology and Rider Waite Smith has a lot more 
like artistic license in all of the cards. So it's the first one that has illustrated pip decks, which are the minor arcana. But anyway, so it's it's interesting because there are kind of like distinct camps. Some people do not read Rider Waite Smith. Some people do not read Terra de Marseille, and that's fine. Either way works, whatever you feel most comfortable with uh, is kind of the way to go. But there are very long standing sort of research and learning traditions associated with each of them. Okay. And so from those two main ones, I'm, I'm guessing there are some offshoots with different art, but still has the similar structure. Sure. Yeah. But, so with, with all of those options out there, what do you look for? in a good deck. Uh, is it pretty? Just buy everyone <laughs> <in the> market. <laughs> I mean, I don't buy every one, but I do have a lot of them. I mean, if I had to estimate how many decks I owned, it would be like at least 300. So I clearly have different like assessment structure than people who are a little bit more like careful <laughs> about the decisions they're making. But I really want the art to be beautiful. And I have all these friends who are amazing artists. And so I kind of like have always had sort of a love of beautiful art. And the cool thing about a tarot deck is that it's 78 cards. Each one of them is different. And it's basically like having your own individual series of interesting pieces of art that you just kind of get to have around. So I'm mostly looking for art. And then also I have a set idea of what cards mean in my head. So I also try to look mm -hmm. for stuff that has uh, illustrated images that align with what my interpretation of the cards are. Because mm -hmm. if, if there's something that just feels totally off base, then that's not a that I'm going to use that often. And that's one of the beauties of tarot in general is that part of the idea is that you're listening to your intuition as you're pulling cards. You're sort of looking for those brain sparks to like figure out exactly what you're sensing from the meanings for the cards. So over time, you kind of do develop really distinct ideas of what some cards mean that are specific to you and your experience with them. But I like things that are pretty. If it's shiny, even better. I mean... <laughs> So if anybody out there, Lauren Lathrop, is overwhelmed, look for pretty <laughs> and shiny. That's, yeah. that's what we're we're going for here. <laughs> well, and also with all of the huge amount of decks that have been put out in the last 15 years is that you can look for really specific needs. Like if you really would like to see various different types of diverse representations of people's experiences, there's a pretty decent chance mm -hmm. you can find a deck specifically for that experience or alternatively one that tries its best to be as inclusive as possible. So I have a lot of decks that only have women in them. And even though there's still masculine energies versus feminine, feminine energies within the decks. I'm drawn to decks that have more, you know, soft bodies of women in them. That's just my own preference. But if you are somebody who wants to make sure that, you know, you don't ever see a human at all and you just want animals or you just want plants or you just want to make sure that there are people with different physical abilities depicted because that's true to your lived experience, you can find those. Mm -hmm. So one really good way to look for your first deck is to just say like, you know, I'm looking for the, uh, you know, deck that has the most Black people in it. And then you can find several decks that are just filled with beautiful depictions of Black people made by Black artists. And that might be the way that you want to go. And so that all is because of how accessible creating tarot decks has become over the last 15 years. And it's totally amazing because it means that no one has to ha use a deck as their first deck that they're totally unrepresented in. Which, you know, is kind of funny with Rider Waite Smith just because it's like people dressed in Renaissance garb. So it really isn't very diverse at all. It doesn't represent anyone's lived experience that's currently alive today. And now that's not even really a worry. You can get as futuristic, you can go for only aliens, you can go, you know, there's so many options that it makes it really a rich thing to tap into. And then eventually you'll just start realizing that you kind of just like all of them. And there are certain artists that you want to support, even if you don't know much about their deck specifically, you're like, well, they're a really cool person. So obviously I want the deck they made, which is where my downfall is. I'm just constantly buying decks from people that I like because I'm like, oh, I want to be friends with you. I should have your art in my house in this way. Is, is there a wildly tarot podcast yeah. deck? Joe, you're going to love this so much because we've known each other for, what, 15 years? <laughs> it's it's got to be more. Uh, ever, I, I've never done art. I'm not an art person. So we okay. do have a deck, but it's meant as like a learning deck. And so it just only has a beautiful sans serif font on both sides. It's literally like flashcard style. 
here's the name of the deck and here's what the meanings are. And the meanings that we do on the back do include both Rider Waite Smith and Tara de Marseille, as well as some like astrological stuff as well. So it is kind of funny because we do have a deck, but it's like the least artic- artistic variation of a deck that you could possibly create because it's just only text, which is pretty par for the course for me, I'd say. <laughs> But it would be a good beginner deck for most people because, like, I I could get a tarot deck and I would have no idea what the pictures mean. Right. Yeah. But I can follow flashcards quite well. Yeah, exactly. You have some experience with flashcards. And that's kind of the goal. And I like even my my younger sister, who's like a very rational person and really struggles Mm -hmm. to trust her intuition. I gave her a copy of our deck and she still uses that pretty regularly just because it sort of alleviates some of the stress of being like, oh, I'm going to get this Mm -hmm. wrong. So why even bother trying? Now, if I wanted to go shopping for decks (laughs) outside of Amazon, which I know I can buy anything I want off of, where Mm -hmm. would I go? I would say a really good place to start would be to just try to find some tarot people on Instagram because almost every tarot seller sells through their own websites or Etsy. Um, There is sort of like a big distinction between mass market uh, tarot decks and indie tarot decks. So there are several tarot deck publishers that sell on Amazon and everything. But a lot of decks don't have that because a lot of the artists are just trying to create limited runs. They don't have like thousands and thousands of copies. They maybe start with 500 copies and then sell it through Etsy or their own websites. So playing around on Etsy is always a good bet or finding someone that you think has great taste in tarot decks just on Instagram or whatever and looking through their stuff also works. Um, Or just Googling, like I said, what is important to you and then looking for creators that have those same values and then buying their decks. How did you initially become involved with the tarot community? Uh, I didn't really know that anyone was doing it. I mean, I, there must've been something in the zeitgeist because I'm definitely not creative enough to pick up that on my own. Like I must've heard about it somewhere, but I was, I just like got really into it after Trump was elected and I just started feeling like very panicked about everything. And I saw maybe some article or something that was mentioning how tarot was like a good meditation tool. And I went to a Catholic school for high school and one of the nuns at my school had like a ceramic bowl filled with these little tiny tiny angel cards that had little angels on them. And then they'd say like a word like peaceful or resilient or whatever. And she, her office was like in the main thoroughfare. So when I was in high school, I used to stop by her office several times a day and grab one just for like advice for the day, which I swear, and I've talked about this before with people, but I think she was totally stacking the bowl knowing that I was going to be walking by because it was always something like peacefulness (laughs) or quiet or solitude or something that I'm like, Sister Christine is trying to tell me something here. So when I saw this thing about tarot, I was like, oh, I already liked using the angel cards and Sister Christine sent me my own box of them when I was at Willamette. Like I opened my mailbox in the, you know, mail area one day and was like, oh, Sister Christine sent me something and it was my own angel card. So I'd already been doing that for like years and years and years and years. But then when I was thinking about like ways that I could feel more in control of the way that my brain was working when the world sort of started feeling a little bit less controllable. Tarot seemed like a really natural fit. And then because I'm such an aesthetic person and I really liked how they looked, I was like, well, everyone's going to make fun of me for being into this kind of woo-woo thing. Esther and I joke that we have sort of the opposite problems where her whole side of everyone thinks that tarot is evil and my whole side of everything feels like tarot is silly. (laughs) Like, oh, who believes in stuff? Like, really? We have this kind of nihilistic liberal arts thing going for us where we're like, oh, people who like trust in the unseen, what's wrong with them? But so because I was all nervous about people seeing it and being kind of judgmental about it, I just started a separate Instagram account for it and developed an audience there because I am have always been pretty good at letting my voice be heard. Like not literally, obviously on social media, but I have a distinct voice. And I think that people were really drawn to that through Mm -hmm. my posts. And that's kind of what led to the podcast. And then the book deal was just that like, it's not just that I'm conveying information. It's also that people feel like they know me, especially now. I think that people are interested in reading things where it feels sort of like poppy almost rather than just like purely academic 
Um, sure. And I work in academia now, sort of. I'm an academic advisor, but it's been funny because I've been right. I wrote my book alongside several faculty member friends. And I just mm-hmm. was laughing so hard about how different our books are because mine is like, they're like, add more jokes to your book. And theirs are like, we need more sources to prove this. When Once I started the Instagram, everything kind of like snowballed from there. But I've only been doing that for like five years. It just, I think being somebody who has a recognizable written voice is sort of what led to us being approached about submitting a book proposal. Well, I guess that's that's my next question. You're college guidance counselor, podcast host, yeah. now author, in addition yeah. to living your own life. And as someone who's been a friend with you for almost two get- decades, I know you're a very reliable friend. People like you, you're a very social person. <laughs> I How don't do answer do my it? phone ever. Well, I, I truly do feel like I probably wouldn't have been able to write the book had it not been last year, which is so weird to say, but I am an academic advisor at a big California public university in Southern California. And I was driving like an hour each way and the book came up in last summer when I was working from home. And even just Mm. having those additional two hours a day helped enormously because you can sort of like turn off your work computer, start writing, and then it's just kind of part of it. And then the other thing is that for the book, we had really, really short turnarounds for all of our deadlines, which for me Mm. as an avoidant kind of person was incredibly crucial because there was no avoiding it. Like I just kept thinking like, look, Holly, you have stayed up or actually, I never would stay up. In college, I would always, I worked at the bistro and hopefully no one who will be, actually Mo was my supervisor there and she probably already knows. I worked at the bistro and I couldn't stay up late. So I would always go to sleep at like nine and then I would wake up at like two o'clock in the morning and go to the bistro before my scone shift because I always would work <laughs> a 6 a.m. scone shift. And I would just write my papers alone in an empty dark bistro at three o'clock in the morning and then turn them in that same day. And I feel like I didn't do as much really early morning rising with the book writing, but it was still kind of a similar strategy where it was like, I'm going to get this done in the time that I can. And I'm also going to work really hard to not give myself a lot of grief for not like, if you have a hard day at work, you're not going to be able to write your best right after. So saying like, okay, this day, even though your deadline's three days from now, today you can just relax because you're not going to get anything done. (laughs) And I don't know if this is like a writing strategy, but one thing that I also did that I think people should do more just in general, maybe even with like work emails and stuff is just voice dictating everything. Mm. I kind of dictated like a large portion of the book because my brain after full days of work would just be like, I have all of this stuff that I want to get out and I'm not really sure how I want to put it. So I would just dictate everything I was thinking about and then start moving it around into like cohesive, thoughtful sentences. What What's the creative process when setting up like a, a podcast episode? Do you just turn on the microphone and you and Esther just talk? Is there <laughs> some pre-planning? Sometimes. Well, no, we just recorded an episode on Sunday where literally that's what we did. We just like started talking and didn't stop for an hour. But normally, yeah, we have kind of like a set like schedule, I guess, or system where we always answer two tarot questions and then do a review of a deck or a book. So that helps a lot to sort of have some structure in that way. I do the like pre-planning and Esther does the editing. So we had to kind of figure out where our strengths Mm -hmm. lied for that. It's been working for almost three years. So... (laughs) We're not going to change it anytime soon. But I just, we are listeners and to submit questions through our website. And we just kind of start from there and develop stuff in that way. Um, we're recording tomorrow morning. The other thing is that my co-host lives in Korea. So we have really different time zones. So we're recording tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. California time because that's like the evening for her. And Mm -hmm. I started today by just kind of like researching the deck that we're going to be reviewing so I could create some sort of cohesive intro for that. And then going through our questions that we accumulated over the summer where we were doing like how to do tarot pre-recorded lessons the whole summer and put together a couple of questions about people's love lives and then did the deck that we're talking about and it's good to go. So it's kind of like figuring out exactly what we wanted our voices to be like. And we decided that we wanted to be like the tarot big sisters. Like we're not teachers. We're people that you go to for questions that are a little bit more approachable. And I think that that's like a comfort area for me for sure. It's one of the reasons why I loved being an opening days leader and also what drew me to being an academic advisor, but it's just like kind of nice to be able to be somebody that people feel safe and comfortable with that they don't feel like they Mm -hmm. need to impress, I guess. And so creating that sort of voice is a really intrinsic part of the beginning of a 
creative process because if you go into anything, but I think especially podcasting and book writing, trying to be everything to all people, that's never going to be an effective way to create a like creative endeavor or succeed in a creative endeavor because you just can't. You can't be everything to all people. And knowing who you want to be and to whom is really, really helpful. And I think that's what allows you to do, like both maintain interest in the topic for so long and also develop a strong enough voice that people want to hear you more, <laughs> if that makes sense. Sure. <laughs> do you incorporate tarot into your career? It's kind of hard to say because I, it's hard to tell now where tarot star, like stops and my career begins. I don't like read tarot for students, but when we were working from campus, I definitely didn't hide the tarot stuff from my students. Like I had, you know, more like, I guess less esoteric decks that are more pep talky all over the place, just because I think Mm -hmm. that everyone can use a little pep talk more so in my career. The way it's come up, not with students is with other coworkers, because I think again, people just, often are looking for somebody to help them figure out what to do. And one of the most popular ways that I read both for the podcast and also for people that I read for in real life is basically trying to, like, if you give me two options, I'll pull cards for what either of those options would look like. Basically, like, what to be aware of, you know, what strategy Mm -hmm. you should take going into it, and then possible outcomes for it. And that really helps with people making decisions on their own, which I do think is part of my role as an academic advisor is like, I'm never here to tell students what they need to do. I'm always here to like provide the options and then give insight into what the options could lead to. And that's the strategy that I take with reading tarot too, because I don't think that it's fair for anyone to feel trapped in one pathway. And there's always a way to get out of anything that you've done to find yourself in a situation that you're not happy with. And that's kind of what I like to use tarot for and also just use my academic advising skills for is like ways to take the next step or feel more empowered almost. So you have no angel card, uh, substitute in your office or anything that you know? I don't know. I maybe, I mean, I just, I could, I mean, the majors that I advise for would be so into it. I advise for basically everything that ends in studies. So I'm like global studies, religious studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, sustainability studies. So all of my students are very like cool. And I think that they wouldn't mind it at all. But I also don't, I mean, since I have this book and I have this podcast and it's sort of like, a moonlighting thing. I don't want to make anyone feel like they have to support me in non-work related ways. (laughs) I'm not going to like email all of my students about my book or anything, even though I think they'd like it. (laughs) But if you happen to have a copy on your desk when they come in and chat with you, that's natural, right? I mean, I'm not sure when I'll be working for my office again, but if I do have a bookshelf Mm. just filled only with these red spines of my own book, you know, (laughs) someone will have to ask at some point, right? (laughs) <laughs> I, I think You're like it's next time on the spine of that <laughs> <laughs> i think next time you know we chat that should be your background just a bookshelf <laughs> all of your books <laughs> back just, to back like in a law library where it's just like an entire exactly. shelf of <laughs> one color but it's just my specific book. <laughs> you know i'll yeah, take that under you. advisement <laughs> Thank you. I, I should disclose that I am not an interior decorator, so I would take it with a grain of salt, but I think it would be funny. <laughs> and I get a pretty good discount on these suckers, so that's that'd right. be worth it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to be fun when I mail you my copy so you can sign it. I know. We have to figure out a way to make that happen because a lot of our listeners have also asked if we can sign it. And I'm always like, yeah, of course, sure. And then I'm like, how am I going to pull this off? Do I need to get a P.O. box? Like, what are we going to do? <laughs> They're tip-in pages. So you sign a, a page that has a piece of glue in it that you sign and they stick it in themselves. Yeah. You'll be fine. I know. You're the first one yeah. that suggested that to me. And I was like, Joe, how do you know so much about publishing? <laughs> you're a mysterious guy. Twitter will <laughs> unveil a lot of secrets if you stay on there long enough. Where did you, where'd you meet uh, Esther? Uh, we met in... This is like so nerdy and like very, very millennial in 2016. But we met through a fan group for a different podcast. So we both mm. were big fans of this one specific podcast. And the, uh, 2016, like right before the election, this deck came out that was called Our Tarot. O-U-R. And the whole premise of it is all these historical badass women um, throughout history and kind of like their personas fit into the archetypes of each card. And the artist went kind of 
viral for it. And so we were in this group together and she commented like, oh my gosh, this looks so cool, but tarot kind of makes me nervous. And so I responded to her and I was like, but why? And I'm like such a tarot evangelist that I was like, it shouldn't be scary. It's just your own intuition, blah, 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 blah. And then she bought, a back when I was still selling readings, she bought a reading from me. And then it just kind of like developed into a friendship. And we were talking so regularly about tarot and we realized that we had a lot of thoughts And what does a millennial do when they have a lot of thoughts, but start a podcast about it. (laughs) But there wasn't really another podcast about it that was as, I guess, like secular as we were. Like a lot of the material podcasts were much more whimsical and spiritual. And that wasn't our goal. Because like I said, we sort of developed this idea of having very strong voices relating to being like a a approachable big sister. So that's what drew people to us was just that we were like, we seemed cool and Mm -hmm. that's flattering. (laughs) I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I, I'll admit I'm not the most into tarot, but I listen to your podcast all the time (laughs) because of how engaging you guys are. Like it, it feels nice. It feels comfortable. It's not overwhelming despite it being a topic that I know nothing about. Yeah. Uh, breaks it down and a casual listener can pick up midway through. You don't have to start at episode one and True. just enjoy it. Yeah. And I also think that if there is something about tarot that specifically interests you, you can find a previous episode where we talk about it. Like if our tarot <laughs> sounds interesting, Esther and I interviewed that creator at the beginning of this year. So you could go start with just finding that interview or whatever. There's a lot of like entry points that don't make it seem so intense. So that's one of the funny things about people who don't do tarot listening to it is that like, I know that my mom doesn't do tarot and she listens to it, but I never know if she listens to all of the episodes or just some of them. So sometimes we'll mm-hmm. record and then I'll be like, Esther, uh, maybe you should take that part out. Not that Tina is some sort of prude, but there's just some stuff that I'm like, I don't think she needs to hear me talk about that that much. Now, once your book becomes the New York Times bestseller. Yeah, right. And you're getting my huge, dreams. huge, huge advance to write the sequel. Is there an area that you'd like to focus in more on and sort of explore that in more detail? Yeah, there totally is. So nobody steal this, anyone who's listening to this. I think that it would be really cool to write a follow-up book that's specifically about the decks of the 70s and 80s because the 70s and 80s, similar to now, was this sort of explosion of like indie publishing and also a time where there were a ton of very, very specific bookstores, like lesbian Mm -hmm. bookstores. You know, there were just so many bookstores that were really hyper-specific to that time period that maybe don't exist anymore that had internal artists who were doing tarot cards. So there are all these decks that are sort of like liberation decks for all sorts of different populations that are not really that readily available because they never got pushed up, pushed out by a mass market publisher. And I think that that would be a really cool thing to explore. It would take way longer to write because that information has not already been established. And in some ways, our first book was cataloging previous information into a fun and easy to read book. And this would have to be like largely totally new research. But I think it would be really neat to explore those sort of like lost decks of the age of Aquarius almost. Maybe that's what we'll we'll call it. Or something. Oh, the funny thing about book contracts is that I didn't know anything about them. And I'm like not a contract person. Uh, I basically would sign anything if it was presented to me. So mm-hmm. one of the interesting things about that whole process of like once we had pitched it, it had been accepted by the publisher, we were signing all the paperwork. The It's very frequent in uh, um, book contracts to have to offer your follow-up book to that same publisher. And then like there's mm-hmm. parameters for if they have to accept it or not. But it's kind of this interesting thing where the framework for the follow-up book would, in our brains, need to be something that the same publisher would have equal interest to. So okay. that's one of the reasons why that sounds so appealing. I mean, I'm always sort of interested in delving into fiction, but that seems a lot more intimidating. Nonfiction is something that I'm comfortable with. Like, you know, we went to liberal arts school. Like, how many papers have we written in our lifetime? And we both, I mean, we both went to grad school too. So like, we're, right. we can write, we can write pages and pages of nonsense. This is not that, right. but... <laughs> 
<laughs> writing is not the hard thing. It's the creativeness of writing fiction that kind of intimidates me. So I think there's like also an area of the market that could do the same thing, like the history of tarot art, but about Oracle decks and Oracle decks are a little bit more flexible. They don't have the same structure that tarot decks have, but I think yeah. that their art history would also be really interesting. So it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, there are a lot of ideas that are percolating, but now as the world is sort of reopening and stuff, it's harder to get together to come up with how that would happen and what it would look like because you know Esther and I both are not prof like full-time writers we're both full-time educators who wrote a book <laughs> right. Right. but I am going right. to change my email signature to say uh author like immediately <laughs> Do you do, you should, and I think you should write that fiction book. You have uh, guaranteed at least one reader. I, <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, do you do readings for others? Uh, just on the podcast. Like part of the podcast is people writing in questions that we answer on the podcast. I used to actually okay. sell them, but it was like too much pressure. If, Lauren, if you want a reading, just message me. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I will do readings for friends all day long. I love doing readings for people. I just feel a lot of pressure when they're paying me to it. And also they're a stranger. I have like one client that I've maintained throughout the last four years that I have not like, you know, said, sorry, I'm not doing that anymore. And the mm -hmm. reason is that she always has me do her year ahead spread. So like at the first of the year, I do this big gigantic spread for her about what her year will look like. And I was so flattered the second time I did it that I was like, oh, well, I'll do this every year for you then for the rest of my life just you and no one else because I'm so flattered that you liked it so much the first time <laughs> so is is there anybody at Willamette current or past student faculty anybody um, that you so this want question, to do a tarot reading for Joe I think you already know the answer to this question and I don't want to make I either do. of us cry but I would love to do a happen. reading for Bob Hawkinson 100% I want to tell him or some sort of mediumship reading, which is not something I do. But Bob Hawkinson, I think about at least once a week how much I wish he knew what we, you and me specifically, were up to with our lives. <laughs> yeah. No, it's still, it breaks my, I, it, there, the similar trajectories that you and I have in life is astounding. But I, I remember connecting with you that he died like the week before either of us had the opportunity to send thank you cards for him yeah, writing. For our like, for getting into grad school. Grad school. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, yeah, it, it was. It was like I, it was the most bizarre timing, and yeah, I still remember when you called me. I was driving up to my now in laws' house, and I was like, "You've got to be kidding right. me!" But yeah, it was like right after both of us had found out that we'd been admitted to grad school, and it Two was like he was the letter writer for both of us. And I would love to. I know, and that he's like one of the people that I think would be so just like completely flabbergasted by this whole tarot thing for me. <laughs> but he would be so into it, Holly. Yeah, he would dive so into it because I'm so into it. Every little thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So for sure, yeah. Bob, he, I mean, he's just like yes. the person that I wish I could talk to the most. And I think other than that, I mean, I feel like my experiences at Willamette were so not tarot-y <laughs> that it's kind of funny to think of. I mean, I could really easily see myself doing it like in Delta Gamma, like sitting in the bow parlor with a bunch of the girls or whatever, or even in the house that I lived in senior year with all of my senior year girls. It, it's easy to imagine doing readings for all of those people, but the thing that's like the ultimate goal would be to somehow be able to reconnect with Bob in some way. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people who knew him feel the same way. <laughs> I think a lot of people would attend that reading. Did you uh, ever get a copy of the letter of Rec he wrote you? I don't believe I did, no. I think you it should, was sent just to the ask. School. Yeah, it was just sent to the schools that I applied to also. And after he died, I emailed like four of them to ask them for a copy of it. And one of them sent it to me. And I read it every year on his uh, fan anniversary, which is the anniversary of his death. And just mm -hmm. like cry about how cool it was that some staff member at my college knew me so well right. that he could say something like, Holly doesn't talk much about her grades, which makes me think that maybe they're not as stellar as she'd hoped they would be. But I know her to be an excellent communicator and just on and on and on. And it just makes me believe in myself in such a way. And it's funny because I'm an admin at a college. Like I have students that I feel super... Right 
loving towards. And I think that a lot of that started with like having that environment at Willamette where I felt like the staff that I was interacting with truly cared about me. And now I'm like, right. some of them probably didn't just based on my own interest level and some of my students, but there are some that I definitely care a lot about. <laughs> We did a lot of sitting in people's offices while they had better shit to do, Joe. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> I volunteered myself to do a reading today, but I actually don't know what that entails. So oh, could you walk okay. me through the entire process? Yes, Apparently there's a yeah. question that I'm supposed to, to ask. You know what, if I think that probably since this is your very first reading, we're not going to ask a specific question unless you have one in mind. We can also just do like something to focus on in the next couple of months to make your life better, something to focus on in the next year to make your life better and just sort of do okay. sort of thematic stuff rather than like answering a specific question. It can be a little bit less intimidating. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Is this your favorite deck? How colorful and how shiny is it? Scale of one to this 10. This is one of my newest decks, but it is very okay. colorful. It's kind of like a lot of pastels. And uh, it came out this last year. It was another Kickstarter. It's sort of 70s, which is what appealed to me because, again, that's kind of an era of tarot decks that I feel like has been lost in some ways um but it's standard writer wade smith inspired and okay. so it's 78 cards um there's 22 major arcana and whatever the opposite of that is <laughs> the minor arcana up to 78 i <laughs> took contemporary mathematics in college uh I, we took no, bio together that was like the only other science class i took the entire bio time. for non-majors <laughs> <laughs> And now we have like friends from Willamette who are actual doctors. And we were like, yeah. how do we get away with this little the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's the only thing we remember. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, this deck is just a really cute one that I like a lot. And also I think that it's kind of fun and a little bit like vintage looking. The other thing that I like about it, and this is sort of deep in the weeds of tarot love, mm -hmm. is that a lot of the times tarot cards have really rounded corners and this one is a little bit less rounded. So it feels almost homemade in some way. Okay. So cool. I'm just going to shuffle, which is probably okay. going to make some noise, but get ready for it. Um, in the podcast, my sister for a really long time thought that we were adding the shuffling in and post like we were Foley artists, just like <laughs> in there being I, like. <laughs> I would 100% watch YouTube videos of you foleying your own podcast. <laughs> like listening to it in the background and like request. trying to <laughs> trying to hit the shuffle you at the right times. <laughs> I kind of could see that happening. I've always thought that being a Foley artist would be a really fun gig. <laughs> I agree. I wouldn't know what to do, but it would be fun. <laughs> Some, I'm sure that there's like a dictionary of common Foley noises or something. You wouldn't have to make it all up. <laughs> That's true. All right. So something, Joe, that you can focus on in the next month to make your life better. Okay. Does I, I'm getting married in a month and two days. Can I focus on oh, that? That's true. Yeah. What to do before the that wedding to make your life better? That would be, yeah. Let's, uh, let's do that. When I got that email, I was like, is Joe Gruber really depriving me of a party with his parents for real? <laughs> you, you are not the only one. Uh, my I know mother where they live. I'll show up with my own booze and music <laughs> to their house. <laughs> I know. We're still in the pandemic. What am I supposed to do, Holly? Hold off I on know. love? That's not I forgive right. you already. I, can, I can't stay mad at you ever. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is actually kind of funny because the cards that I pulled for what you can be doing between now and your wedding to make your life better is Four of Pentacles and the Wheel of Fortune. So the Four of Pentacles, you can see it's this figure who's sitting on a chair and he has yeah. pentacles that he's sort of grasping with his hands. So often mm -hmm. this card comes up in situations where there's some boundaries that need to be maintained. And so that's kind of hilarious that I'm actively teasing you about your boundaries. And then this card pops up. Um, and then the other card that came up with it. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can read when you pull two cards together. But I like to use them in conjunction with each other. So the other card that I pulled is the Wheel of Fortune. And the Wheel of Fortune is sort of what it sounds like. We're all sort of familiar with the concept that things change and shift and we're not really in control of it. We just have to like hold on for the ride as things sort of go through these cycles. And I think that 
when paired together, it's saying that to make your life better over the next month before your wedding, you have to hold on to those boundaries as people sort of send you through this ring of emotions, because that's how you can maintain a sense of control is just by holding on to your own boundaries. And part of the pentacle suit, so the minor arcana is split into four suits and the pentacles relates to like either money or physical tangible things. So in a lot of ways, these two things paired together is like, don't get swept up in other people's expectations, hold tight to your boundaries, especially related to money, and let the let the wheel continue to change rather than you feeling like you need to chase after it. The wheel's going to keep spinning and you're just in charge of holding on to your own boundaries and your own responsibilities and protecting yourself in that way. And people will get over it because that's the other part of the wheel of fortune is that part of that wheel shifting is that like people don't stay mad. They can't stay mad, especially when you're doing something like setting your boundaries. This has been <laughs> the most enlightening and enjoyable three minutes. In a while. <laughs> Man, I feel so much better. I, I, I want to make the like, you know, oh, this, you know, cheaper than therapy. Everyone should go to therapy. This should supplement yeah, everyone therapy. Everyone still go to therapy, but also <laughs> find out your roots grow. <laughs> but this, this, the two cards that you pulled spoke quite a bit. And uh, I criticized that I'm texting people during this. No, I'm taking notes on uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reading that just occurred. Uh, so sometimes because the we, funny reaction that people have is, oh my God, that is so fucking rude. Like people sometimes really feel like the cards no. totally call them out where it's like, no, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> no, it's it, because it's been, you know, pandemic weddings, you have to make a lot of hard decisions yeah. and not many people are happy about it. So, you know, reinforcing, you know, set boundaries, continue through the noise. It's, it's comforting to hear that from someone instead of me telling it to myself. Right, um, exactly, exactly. You, like, you know, no. that it's the, and I think that that's how a lot of tarot can kind of feel. It's like, you know that that's true, but you still want the confirmation or to hear it again from another place. And I yeah. think also a lot of the pushback that you're probably getting about your wedding is that you have been such a wild dancer at so many of our weddings that everyone just wants to see you wildly dance at your own. <laughs> that's, so you'll just have to tape it. <laughs> I'll make some TikToks. And, uh... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah, Madison Every, is exactly everyone. right. Between tarot and therapy, that's like kind of what got a lot of us through the last couple of years. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. And it's, it's uh, you know, part of it was to hear what you just said from one of my best friends is comforting, but there's also element that there, you know, the element of chance, like the universe yeah. is speaking to me, like everything's going to be okay. It, yeah. It's truly a, a great experience. Oh, good. But I'm so glad that you not, resonated with it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you. That was, that was far more, I thought I was doing it sort of as a, a, an <laughs> act of this show. Joe, but you just no, can't it, underestimate the woo-woo things I can get people to do. <laughs> I, I know. The downside for you is, is you're going to be getting a lot more phone calls from me. Holly, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, you know, I've told you numerous times, I listen to your podcast just so I can hear your voice. Uh, we have many followers the same that, that are here just for uh, your, your spirit, your glow, everything about you. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Uh, I look you. forward to receiving your book, uh, The History of Tarot Art, Demystifying the Art and Arcana Deck by Deck. It's coming out November 30th of this year, pre-order. Um, do we and know where we can pre-order? Yeah, so but a, call your local bookstore and demand it. Yeah, call your local bookstore. But for those of you who are tarot curious, there is also tarot cards in the back, just the major arcana from a really cool historical deck. And there's also a lot of like fun little how-tos in the fold-out section. So even if you're not like a tarot proficient person, it's still totally worth picking up a copy just to have one. And it's really pretty. I mean, this is what the dust cover looks like, but... You also have the interior, which is just all of these cool wow. decks. Super neat. And my name right that's there. That's, that's, a, that's the most important it. part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are like me, who lack patience and don't want to wait till November 30th, uh, Holly's podcast, the Wildly Tarot podcast is available. Uh, Apple, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast. You have a Patreon as well. I think there's some yeah. goodies that if you subscribe, you can order some things there. 
Um, or listen to us talk about the original Charmed for the entire first season, which is what we've been recapping on Patreon. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we would love to hear your suggestions uh, for alumni, faculty, guests. Uh, we should connect with our topics that we should pursue to discuss, much like we did tonight. Uh, please write to us at alumni at willamette.edu. Thank you once again, Holly, uh, for joining us. Thank you all for logging in to listen to us. And uh, please take care. Yeah, we love you. Hey guys. <laughs>